Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, two leading pressure groups are today calling for an investigation to look into failings at the Home Office in recent years. Liberty and the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants say an independent commission should be set up to look at the government's so-called hostile environment policy. Meanwhile, the government say they'll bring forward details of compensation for people from the Windrush generation who've been affected. In a moment, I'll speak to the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. But first, let's go back to Kevin McGuire and Kate McCann on College Green. Kevin Maguire, over the weekend, um, Dawn Butler, it was, in fact, from the Labour Party, described the government's policy to tackle illegal immigration as institutionally racist. Is that fair? Yeah, and Syed Avasi, a, a Tory peer, former co-chair of, of the Conservative Party, said it, the, the go-home vans reminded her of uh, Enoch Powell's River, Rivers of Blood speech 50 years ago. I think the problem we, ha we have here, and the reason Dawn Butler can make that argument, is the people who are affected are predominantly black or Asian from the, from the policy, and that is a definition of institutional racism, and it is a terrible, terrible scandal. And Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, is fighting for a reputation and political life because she can't blame the person who is really at the heart of this, mm. uh, her predecessor, Theresa May, the Prime Minister. Will a minister have to quit, Kate, over this? I suspect probably not. I think the pressure of last week uh, was really on both Amber Rudd and Theresa May, obviously as the former Home Secretary, and neither of them really came close to quitting. And actually, I think what's interesting is if you listen to Labour talk about the position that those two senior politicians are in, they do stop short of calling for the Prime Minister to go. They say maybe Amber Rudd should consider her position, but I'm yet to hear any senior Labour politician say the Prime Minister should do so. And actually Labour are arguing that this policy started under Theresa May, so the fact that they're not calling for it says to me actually neither of them probably will lose their jobs. I mean, is there a bit of embarrassment, Kevin, on the side of Labour who abstained in that vote on immigration, I think in 2014, when it was tightened up? rather than actually voting against. No, absolutely. I think Jeremy Corbyn did vote against. I think it was one of his uh, yes, being a I'm rebel sure and, br did. and breaking the whip. Yeah. Uh, no, there is there is some embarrassment uh, about that. They made a fuss at the time about Theresa May's go-home uh, vans, but they, they too were caught up in this hysteria around migration, and they should have been bold and uh, stood their ground. They didn't, so there is some embarrassment now. But, of course, with the new leadership, with Corbyn, he can say, look, it, it wasn't me, Gov, uh, we've moved on. The government can't because it was the government in power implementing those policies. Bob Kerslake, the former head of the civil service, said a minister, I imagine a Lib Dem minister, had said there's a, a whiff of Nazism. It sounded a bit over the top to me. But, ne but nevertheless, there was a distaste around at the time and Labour should have had the bottle to stand out. Thank you for sticking with us. Joining me here in the studio is Satbir Singh, Chief Executive of the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. Welcome to The Daily Politics. Um, today, you and Liberty are calling for an independent commission to look into what's been happening at the Home Office. Why? Well, it's become clear over the last week that the issues at the Home Office go far beyond Windrush and that the Windrush crisis itself was not only predictable but predicted. There were divisions in the Cabinet over this. There were warnings from within Parliament, from outside Parliament. At every turn, the government was warned that this is exactly the kind of crisis they could expect if they did what they ultimately did. And at the moment, given that so much of that was done under the watch of the then Home Secretary, now Prime Minister Theresa May, the only way to achieve a swift resolution of this or to move forward is to have that independent commission of inquiry to look at how we got into this mess. Right. Do you agree with that? Should that happen? I think we should certainly make sure we learn the lessons. Whether an independent commission of inquiry is the way to do that, I I'm not 100% sure. But what I'm would you support? I, I think what we need to do is really get to the bottom. There's going to be a statement in the uh, House later on today on Windrush. Um, that's going to move us forward in what we understand. I think what we need to make sure is, as I say, that we learn the lessons and that this doesn't happen again. Because ultimately, the Windrush problem was an unintended consequence but was it? of an intended But was policy. it an unintended no, consequence? No We've just heard evidence. And 
I've read the extracts from the impact assessment of 2014, where it very clearly warned ministers that there could be an unintended consequence for people who were lawfully here and given indefinite leave to remain, but may be swept up in the tightening up of immigration and, procedures. And, and no one has ever argued that the Windrush generation and others like it were intended to be made to feel no, unwelcome. But they didn't care if they might. And, and I think it's not about not caring that they might. I think ministers would rightly reject that very strongly. I think it's about making sure that due care is taken, that the scale of those unintended consequences is not do, as extraordinary and as reprehensible as it has been. I don't. Those warnings were there. They were given to the government. They were given to Parliament by many, many people, but many, many organisations and experts on this issue. And it's very clear that the government said that we accept that those risks exist and we simply don't find that cost to be too high for us in our pursuit of a policy that essentially didn't lead to a significant number of voluntary departures from the country. It was all about catering and pandering to voices which were calling for sort of more hysterical policies on immigration rather than evidence-based policies on immigration. I, I think the difference is in a commitment at the time to make sure that those concerns were mitigated, that the situation that we've seen didn't arise. Because as I say, no one wanted this situation to, to arise. This is genuinely unintended. And I think that's very clear. What is important, however, is to say that this is a government and a Labour Party at the time that wanted to be tough on illegal migration. And that is a legitimate thing to pursue. But Satbir, you actually raised these issues, didn't you, um, with the government and in fact uh, brought forward specific cases and you say they were ignored? We did. And we brought forward evidence through our own impact assessment of the right to rent scheme, which were themselves ignored by the government. We've been engaging in correspondence with the Home Office on this and warning against the rollout of those schemes to the rest of the country. And the government has announced that it's prepared to roll those out regardless of what the impact assessments say. So, in other words, there was a deliberate policy of ignoring. It's only since it's reached a critical mass, since the, the papers have been headlining on a daily basis, that the government finally sat up and took notice. Well, I, I would come back to the original point. No one has ever said that generations like the, Wind, like the Windrush generation well, were, intended to, in that uh, were, in, were intended to suffer. And the but Prime Minister has apologised, the, ho the Home Secretary has apologised. Mm -hmm. That's right, the right thing. Should more action have been taken at the time? I think with hindsight well, it's now clear Let's have a look should. at whether the action is being taken now. You went for a meeting with senior Downing Street officials last week. What happened? Um, we went to that meeting with very specific proposals about what a task force might look like and what sort of MO might help the government in dealing with the ongoing Windrush crisis. Uh, we weren't offered any response. There was no specific guidance issued by the Home Office. There was no paperwork that we were provided with. But, but I was under the distinct impression during that meeting that my sole purpose, and I was asked, was to provide a comment that said that the government was doing a fantastic job on this and that, as the leader of an independent charity, felt to me to be incredibly inappropriate before I'd heard anything beyond a, a few short speeches in the Commons on this that did feel to be incredibly inappropriate. I, I, I do think it's worth saying, though, that the Prime Minister of Jamaica, for instance, after he met the Prime Minister, has come out and said that he is confident that justice will be done. So I think we should listen to a range of voices But we should on this also stuff. listen to the people we represent. Absolutely. Yeah, and the people I represent feel angry, they feel unwelcome, and when they are told, as Amber Rudd told me to tell them last week, that they should trust the Home Office, and I'm quoting, I think those words ring very, very hollow to my constituents. So I'm focusing on getting them the help and mm. advocacy that they mm. need. And I think that's where Amber Rudd should take stock and take responsibility. When we talk about compensation, people have been deprived health care, they've been detained, um, and some of them have lost their jobs. What sort of compensation is going to satisfy and be justified? I think for the individuals who have been directly affected, the Windrush cases, um, there will need to be a look at lost earnings, emotional distress. We've got people who have died. We've got people who've been denied health care. And it's, it's not up to me to decide what type of compensation will be required. But I would be surprised if the government's obligations here don't have to be very, very significant. Do you, do you accept that? There will have to be serious amounts of compensation if the Prime Minister really wants to show that she understands the suffering that's been caused. She apologised for confusion and anxiety last week in Parliament. Is that enough? I mean, if I locked you up in a detention centre wrongly for several weeks against your will and threatened to deport you and afterwards I said, I'm sorry for any anxiety I've caused you, would that wash? I think that's why we're talking about compensation as well, because simply saying sorry in a situation like this 
doesn't wash. I think we've got to be clear that this isn't just about loss of earnings. This is about saying to people that uh, they were welcome. They are, as Theresa May said, part of us. And to have turned that on its head, even inadvertently, is something that it's right that we should apologise for and it's right that we should offer compensation for. So we're talking about, you know, tens of thousands of pounds to individuals, do you think, in your mind? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert to put, figure, put a figure on it, but I could, I could imagine well, that we would be in that position. How's the hotline going, this hotline of specialised experts helping people? Well, when we called it last week, we had no confidence in it because the people at the other end of the hotline didn't know what the countries of the Commonwealth were. This is a sticking plaster. Um, if you set up a special task force to deal with a problem that your department was supposed to be dealing with, there is an implicit understanding there, an admission that your department isn't fit for purpose for dealing with cases like that. Um, this was the result of a series of decisions, the withdrawal of legal aid, the withdrawal of access to justice. None of these people would have found themselves in detention if their rights hadn't been stripped away under what's an eight-year-long program of creating a hostile environment and an environment of real hostility towards people who look and sound different. And that's why my constituents do not trust the Home Office and why I think the Home Secretary needs to sort this out. She needs to make it her number one priority and not just talk about it, not just say she's sh sorry, but shows she's sorry. Was it wrong that Labour abstained in 2014? Well, I wasn't here in 2014. I know. And I think there were things in that bill that, that you know, that, that there were other measures that the Labour Party actually did put forward amendments on which the government rejected. However, I'm focused on now, which is my constituents are angry now right. and they feel unwelcome and that's absolutely wrong. Sophia Singh, thank you for coming in. Right now, though, let's just take you quickly to the House of Commons, where Amber Rook, the Home Secretary, is talking about the Windrush Everyone that government. arrived in the UK before 1973, who were given settlement rights and not required to get any specific documentation to prove these rights. Since 1973, many of this Windrush generation would have obtained documentation confirming their status, or would have applied for citizenship and then a British passport. From the 1980s, successive governments have introduced measures to combat illegal immigration. The first NHS treatment charges for overseas visitors and illegal migrants were introduced in 1982. Checks by employers on someone's right to work here were first introduced in 1997. Measures on access to benefits in 1999. Civil penalties for employing illegal migrants in 2008 and the most recent measures in the Immigration Acts of 2014 and 16 introduce checks by landlords before property is rented and checks by banks on account holders. The public expects us to enforce the immigration rules approved by Parliament as a matter of fairness for those who abide by the rules. And I'm personally committed to tackling illegal migration because I have seen in this job the terrible impact it has on some of the most vulnerable in our society. But these steps intended to combat illegal migration have had an unintended and sometimes devastating impact on people from the Windrush generation who are here legally but have struggled to get the documentation to prove their status. This is a failure by successive governments to ensure these individuals have the documentation they need and this is why we must urgently put it right. Because it's abundantly clear that everyone considers people who came in the Windrush generation to be British, but under the current rules, this is not the case. Some people will just have indefinite leave to remain, which remains they cannot leave the UK for more than two years and are not eligible for a British passport. This is the main reason we've seen the distressing stories of people leaving the UK over a decade ago and not being able to re-enter. So I want to enable the Windrush generation to acquire the status that they deserve, British citizenship, quickly, at no cost, and with proactive assistance through the process. First, I will waive the citizenship fee for anyone in the Windrush generation who wishes to apply for citizenship. This applies to those who have no current documentation and also to those who have it. Second, I will waive the requirement to carry out a knowledge of language and life in the UK test. Third, the children of the Windrush generation who are in the UK, most cases are British citizens. However, where that is not the case, they need to apply for naturalisation. I shall waive the fee. Fourth, I will ensure that those who made their lives here 
but have now retired to their country of origin, are able to come back to the UK. Again, I will waive the cost of any fees associated with this process and will work with our embassies and high commissions to make sure people can easily access this offer. In effect, this means anyone from the Windrush generation who now wants to become a British citizen will be able to do so. And this builds on the steps that I have already taken. On the 16th of April, I established a task force in my department to make immediate arrangements to help those who needed it. This included setting up a helpline to get in touch with the Home Office. And let me be quite clear, this helpline and the information shared will not be used to remove people from the country. Its purpose is to help and support. We have successfully resolved nine cases so far and made 84 appointments to, of, to issue documents. My officials are helping those concerned to prove their residence and they're taking a proactive and generous approach so they can easily establish their rights. We do not need to see definitive documentary proof of date of entry or of continuous residence. This is why the debate about registration slips and landing cards is misleading. Instead, the caseworker case will make a judgment based on all the circumstances of the case and on the balance of probabilities. Previously, the burden of proof on some of the Windrush generation to evidence their legal rights was too much on the individual. And now we're working with this group in a much more proactive and personal way in order to help them. We were too slow to realize there was a group of people that needed to be treated differently. And the system was too bureaucratic when these people were in touch. The Home Office is a great Department of State. It works tirelessly to keep us safe and protect us. It takes millions of decisions each year that profoundly affects people's lives. And for the most part, it gets these right. But recent events have shown that we need to give a human face to how we work and exercise greater judgment where and when it is justified. That's why, going forward, I will be establishing a new customer contact centre so anyone who is struggling to navigate the many different immigration routes can speak to a person and get the appropriate advice. This will be staffed by experienced caseworkers who will offer expert advice and identify a systemic problem much more quickly in the future. I will also be putting in place 50 senior caseworkers across the country to ensure where more junior members of staff are unsure about a decision, they can speak to someone with experience to ensure discretion is properly exercised. There's also been much concern about whether the Home Office has wrongly deported anyone from the Windruff generation. The 1971 Immigration Act provides protection for this group if they have lived here for more than five years, if they arrived in the country before 1973. And I'm now checking all Home Office records going back to 2002 to verify that no one has been deported in breach of this policy. This is a complex piece of work that involves manually checking thousands of records. So far, 4,200 records have been reviewed out of nearly 8,000, which date back to 2002, and no cases have been identified which breach the protection granted under the 1971 Act. This is an ongoing piece of work, and I want to be absolutely certain of the facts before I draw any conclusions. I will ensure the House is informed of any updates, and I intend to have this data independently audited once my department has completed its work to ensure transparency. Mr Speaker, it was never the intention that the Windrush generation should be disadvantaged by measures put in place to tackle illegal migration. I am putting... Here they come. Here they come. Make sure you wave to the cameras. We're going to have to leave it there for a second, guys, because we want to go straight back to the House of Commons. Of course, if we see baby Cambridge come out, we'll bring those pictures to you in just a second. Straight back to the Home Secretary. I will consider further, in the light of the cases that come forward, whether any policy changes are needed to deal fairly with these cases. Mr Speaker, I have set out urgent measures to help the Windrush generation 
documents their rights, how this government intends to offer them greater rights than they currently enjoy, how we will compensate people for the hardship they have endured and the steps I'll be taking to ensure that this never happens again. None of this can undo the pain already endured. But I hope it demonstrates the government's commitment to put these wrongs right going forward. Diana Burt. I'd like to thank the Home Secretary for the advanced sight of her statement. Many people, both in this house and outside, think the events around the Windrush generation are one of the biggest scandals in the administration of home affairs for a very long time. The Home Secretary said the situation should never have been allowed to happen. She is the Home Secretary. She allowed it to happen. These cases can't come as a surprise to her because for some time, many of my colleagues on this side of the House have been pursuing individual cases. She is behaving as if it's a shock to her yeah. that her officials are implementing regulations in the way she intended them to be implemented. The Home Secretary has to understand that ultimately the buck stops with her. Yeah. Now, sometimes ministerial maladministration occurs because officials are acting in error. Sometimes maladministration is a question of unforeseen circumstances. But the problem with the plight of the Windrush generation is that it was foreseeable, mm -hmm. it was foreseen. Yeah. People both inside our department and members of this House tried to draw the government's attention to it. The key was the 214 Immigration Act, yeah. which removed the protection from Commonwealth citizens who up until then had been exempt from deportation. I spoke about this and explained it to ministers. The, my friend, the member for Tottenham, voted against this. My friend, the current leader of the Labour Party, the member for Islington North, voted against this. But ministers paid no attention. As for the hostile environment in general, four years ago, an internal Home Office memo said the hostile environment could make it harder for foreign nationals to find homes and could provoke widespread dis discrimination. Furthermore, the then Tory Secretary of State for Community, Local and Government said the costs and risks of this policy considerably outweigh the benefit. So let's repeat the costs for the benefit of the Home Secretary. Patriotic Commonwealth citizens treated like liars, benefits cast, health care denied, jobs lost, people actually evicted from their housing. And whether they were deported, refused re-entry or detained, these people were separated from family and friends in breach of their human rights. Yes. And this was a system where people who had come here very often as young children were required to show four pieces of, all, of original documentation for each year they were supposedly in this country. Who could have believed that that was a sustainable or fair situation? And as I said, it is not a surprise to ministers or their officials the situation we're in, because member after member has written to the Home Office trying to draw their attention to these cases. Now, there are elements in her statement I welcome. I welcome the waiving the citizenship fee. I welcome the waiving of the requirement to carry out the knowledge of language and life in the UK, the UK test. However, some of these people, having been in the UK all their lives, would almost certainly pass that test with flying colours. I welcome waiving the naturalisation fee for children, and in particular, I welcome allowing people who have retired from this country to return and waiving the costs of their fees.
But the Home Secretary talks about the problems of legislation, but she's not suggesting changes in legislation. Yeah, yeah. It will be easy, for instance, to restore the protections for Commonwealth citizens, which existed yeah. prior to 2014. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On compensation, there's no detail on compensation, but the Home Secretary will understand that on this side, we will be pursuing the point, because it's important that the compensation is not a token sum of money, but properly reflects the actual costs and the damage to family life caused by this policy. I'm glad that ministers thought better of her early position on refusing to provide data on deportation. They told my friend, the member for Wolverhampton North East in January, that providing information on deportations and detention would require a manual check of individual records, which could be done only at disproportionate cost. I'm glad, the Home Secretary has thought better of that position and is now undertaking that manual test to uh, check on deportations. But what about people in detention? I visited Yarl's Wood and met women in exactly this position who had been detained for very many months. The Home Office must know who it has in detention. The Home Secretary is shaking her head. You must know who you have in detention, and you must know why they are there. And I am asking her to produce the figures of those members of the Windrush generation who are in detention. As for her new customer care centre, we'll see how that works. Will this be new staff, or will it be staff transferred from elsewhere in immigration and nationality? I share her care for illegal immigration, illegal immigrants, many of them are exploited by employers. If they're women, they're subject to domestic violence and they live frightened and miserable lives. But we are pursuing this issue because of our concern for our constituents who were Commonwealth citizens and legally here. And the Home Secretary need not believe that this ends here. Coming up behind the Windrush cohort is a slightly later cohort of persons from South Asia. Mm. And in, in years to come, very few years to come, they will be asked, mm. even though they've lived there all their, all their lives, even though their children are British, even though they've worked all their lives, they'll be asked for four pieces of data for every year they've been there. And they will be subject to the humiliation, the humiliation that the Windrush generation have been subject to. Let me end by saying this. On Thursday night, I held a meeting in the House of Commons with people in the community concerned about this issue. We just advertised it for two days alone. 500 people came. They packed out four committee rooms and we had to turn away hundreds more. The Home Secretary must understand how upset communities are about what has happened to this generation. And they feel it reflects something about the way this government regards the entire community. And absolutely, in closing, yeah, people are saying rubbish. People are saying rubbish. Let me, let me say this. My parents, brothers and sisters and cousins, largely worked in the National Health Service, in factories and London Transport. I always remember one of my uncles saying to me with tremendous pride that he had never missed a day off work. This was a generation with unparalleled commitment to this country, unparalleled pride in being British, unparalleled commitment to hard work and contributing to society. And it is shameful that this government has treated this generation in this way. Yes. Yes. Secretary. Well, I'm pleased to hear that there are some areas which the Right Honourable Lady and I agree on and the value of those citizens, the admiration for the work they have done here, and our respect for them on this side of the House as on that side of the House remains undimmed. We are absolutely committed to that. I am pleased, too, that she has welcomed the substantial nature of the changes that I have put in place in order to address the urgent problem that is now to address the fact that this cohort of people need to have their documentation put in place. She challenged me on some of my comments I made earlier. And I just want to be clear again, if I may, is that this is a group of people who should have had their legal status formally 
in, given to them a long time ago. She will have seen, as I did, that some of the references of the individuals who have been so heartbreakingly let down did happen before 2010. They happened when people tried to travel. Uh, the, the right hon. Leader may have voted against some of those, but this is not something that has just happened overnight. Unfortunately, the fact that this group of people who should have had proper formal legal status put in place any time from 1973 fell foul of that bit by bit, more and more, as government after government took different and more formal steps about making sure that we protect people from illegal migration. And where we are with this is that there is legal migration and there is illegal migration. The group that we are talking about were part of... We're going to leave the House of Commons. Amber Rudd addressing the Windrush scandal. Diane Abbott, the Shadow Home Secretary, responding to her. We're going to keep our ears on this. The main line out of what's been said so far is that Amber Rudd says a citizenship fee will be waived for anyone from the Windrush generation who wants to apply for citizenship. She says she will waive the fee for the naturalisation process as well and compensation will be offered. Any member of the Windrush generation and their children will be granted British citizenship if they want it. That's the pledge of the Home Secretary. After a week of bad headlines, Amber Rudd also told MPs that anyone who's gone to another country and is stuck because of the government's treatment of Windrush migrants will be able to come back to the UK. And for all involved in applying for citizenship, any fees will be waived. Labour, though, hit back, blaming the Home Secretary personally for the problem, saying she must have known and yet allowed the scandal to happen. Our political editor, Laura Koonsberg, has the latest. Arrivals at Tilbury. The Empire Windrush brings to Britain 500 Jamaicans. Those who came here are not numbers, but people with families, with responsibilities and homes. The Home Secretary's words today. But the Windrush generation made those homes here, only to be failed. Secretary Amber Rudd. There's no hiding from this mess. Each individual case is painful to hear, but so much more painful, often harrowing, for the people involved. The state has let these people down. You did, they cried, she and Theresa May before. Now there's an offer of an easier route to citizenship to fix the mistakes. So I want to enable the Windrush generation to acquire the status that they deserve, British citizenship quickly, at no cost, and with proactive assistance through the process. None of this can undo the pain already endured. But I hope it demonstrates the government's commitment to put these wrongs right going forward. Yeah. Nick Broderick came to Britain from Jamaica as a toddler, but says he was threatened with deportation and lost his job. He's £30,000 out of pocket. So does today's promise make up for the distress and what's happened to him? It's positive, isn't it? It's going to help a lot of people. I don't know if we're going to get any money back or anything like that. I'm just glad to be, become a citizen and I can, you know, work again, get my life back on track. That's what I'm hoping for. Labour says it should never have been allowed to happen. This was a generation with unparalleled commitment to this country, unparalleled pride in being British, unparalleled commitment to hard work and contributing to society. And it is shameful that this government has treated this generation in this way. Yeah. For the offer of citizenship without fees or a test really right the wrongs. I and others are in this country because my parents were born under the British Empire. When she says that people can apply for citizenship if they want it, does she understand that that citizenship was theirs all along? Yeah. It's not just this Home Secretary who's been under pressure over this saga. Was it Theresa May? Good morning. But remember, her boss, the Prime Minister, was in charge when the rules changed. Just weeks ago, ministers were playing this down. Now they can't move fast enough to try to move on. 
Well, let's talk to Laura at Westminster. So can they move on, Laura? This is a question. Have they done enough to draw a line under this? Well, this has been a real mess, Fiona. It's been a very damaging episode for the government, not just because of the political closeness that it has to the Prime Minister, given that she was in charge at the Home Office for six years. And it's not just going to be easy to sweep this away because it's a big administrative job. There are a lot of details still to be worked through. So in that sense, it is going to be difficult for the government to be able to move on and for somehow for them to be able to forget about it. It's also going to be hard because MPs are already warning that there are other groups who have been caught up in the tightening of the immigration rules who have also been suffering unfairly as the Home Office has been working through their cases. So I don't expect this to be the last time that we hear MPs raising concerns of members of the public around the country who feel they've been caught up unfairly when they have the right very much to be here. But, you know, ministers also have to carry out something that is difficult to balance. They believe and public opinion suggests that people want a fair and tight immigration system. But what people clearly do not want is something that is perceived to be cruel. And getting that balance right in the years to come is no easy task. Laura at Westminster, thank you. So a new raft of measures announced by the government which they claim will allow people from the Windrush generation to get back their UK citizenship at no extra cost. But what about the toll the scandal has already taken on the families affected, like Trevor and Desmond Johnson, who arrived as boys from Jamaica in 1971 and claim they've had their lives wrecked? Trevor, whom we featured last week, has faced threats of deportation, while his brother has not been able to visit Britain since he went back to Jamaica to look after his mother back in 2003. Simeon Brown has been to meet Desmond Johnson in Jamaica to hear his story. That's me and my sister when we were young. Yeah, yeah. I'm here. That's my brother Trevor and that's my big sister. And she's still in London? Yeah, all of them, all of them. This yeah. home in the parish of Clarendon belonged to, to the Johnsons, a family fractured by the whims of Britain's changing migration laws. My friends, since I've been out here, they keep uh, calling my phone and asking me, when you're coming back, when you're coming back. Um, in 1971, Desmond was among a generation of children who left Jamaica unaccompanied to rejoin parents in the so-called motherland. And what was that like, being an 11-year-old in oh, a very we, new country? We, we, we got a lot of abuse, like gollywaga and this and that. And, but that's just, <laughs> yeah, these things, I'm not worried about that. That's where I grew up, that's where I did my work. I started off as a paper round, then I ended up in a market, and from the market I went to um, the construction. I paid my taxes, insurance, everything. But the country where Desmond grew up, worked, and got married in, is refusing to let him come back. You left England in 2001, mm -hmm. and then in 2014 you tried to apply for a visa to visit your family, yeah. and right. you were told that that was denied. Yeah. And how did that make you feel? Got it. Got it. I don't want to go back to England to live. I don't want to stay in England. This is where I belong. This is my mother. 83-year-old Iseline is the reason Desmond returned to Jamaica. Eat a hand. Thank you. After his father died, Desmond came back to provide care for the matriarch of the family. She has as much difficulty walking as she does wondering why Britain has turned its back on the children of the Windrush generation. I went to England with a British passport, not Jamaican passport, I bombed British. I leave them when they're small to drive my husband. So I don't know what they're doing up here. She, you know, she, dis she disrespected these people on the I do not us. know what they're doing up here. Do you, do you feel like you, you know, gave up so much to go to England to work, you left your family here, yeah. eventually you had enough money to bring them over and yeah. now you feel like they've almost kind of completely forgotten your contribution? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. That. Britain shipped their ancestors here, encouraged them to labour in England when needed and now has restricted the movement of their descendants. Really teased off. Mummy. Britain's relationship with Jamaica is emotive, but it's also clerical and there's a technicality to Desmond's story. In your visa application, yeah. you failed to disclose a criminal record. Yeah, that's, that's correct, yeah. I honestly never 
meant to deceit uh, anyone. But I honestly didn't even think about that. He said, have, have you got a criminal? I said, no. Why do you say no if you, if you have one? Because I didn't remember, that's why. I had to call my sister and ask her what criminal, and then she reminded me at the time when I was drunk. So, Desmond says at most, his offences resulted in fines several decades ago. But he is not the only member of his family to have been caught up by the tightening of immigration rules. This is me, which is Trevor, and that's my brother Desmond. Last week, Channel 4 News spoke to Trevor Johnson. He feared deportation back to Jamaica. But I had to fight and, you know, cause I got where I had to get to. And I'm not here illegally, you know what I mean? My parents was here, I was, my mum was getting child benefit for me and my brother. Trevor won that fight. The question is why does a family that was born British have to? For you, what is there to visit? Like, what do you have there? Uh, first, uh, my daughter, my son, my nieces, nephews, cousins, my sisters, my brother. It's been 15 years. Younger 15 years is a long time. 350 years is even longer. That's how deep Britain's roots in this country go. And for a people here because of them, Britain's abandonment is a betrayal. Simeon Brown reporting from Jamaica and in response, the Home Office here said they didn't want anyone who had contributed so much to our society to feel unwelcome, uh, adding that the Home Secretary had apologised unreservedly for any distress caused and they were urgently reviewing these cases. They've urged Desmond Johnson to contact the new Home Office helpline. Well, in the Commons, the Home Secretary defended the government's immigration policy but admitted its impact had been unintended and sometimes devastating. Labour's Diane Abbott said she blamed Amber Rudd personally for the Windrush scandal, declaring that she had allowed it to happen. Our political editor, Gary Gibbon, is in the House of Commons. Gary. Well, this was the government trying to get on the front foot with an action plan to deal with the saga of its own making. There was a lot of scepticism amongst opposition MPs about whether the Home Office could, as Amber Rudd promised, show a human face to Windrush families and be more generous. A lot of scepticism as well, it has to be said, about whether uh, the Home Office could really organise the uh, compensation that was now on offer and the citizenship uh, that was uh, now on offer. The other big scepticism that came up again and again in the House was people worried that there could be other communities out there, uh, like the Windrush generation, South Asian communities from India, Bangladesh, Pakistan and East Africa, who could be in for similar treatment. I have to say this was not one of those occasions where the minister uh, under fire, in this case Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, looks like they're in danger of losing their position. A lot of noises off on her own side about Amber Rudd, but none of them uh, to her face in the chamber today. All the attacks came from the opposition. Here's how Amber Rudd's statement went. There had already been apologies for the treatment of the Windrush generation. Today, Parliament heard how the government intends to make amends. The Windrush generation would be entitled to British citizenship, the Home Secretary said, with all the usual tests and costs waived. So I want to enable the Windrush generation to acquire the status that they deserve. British citizenship, quickly, at no cost, and with proactive assistance through the process. The Home Secretary started her day visiting the UK Visa and Immigration Office in Croydon with the High Commissioner for Barbados. Amber Rudd later apologised for the way officials had treated the Windrush generation, demanding documentation many were unlikely to have, with consequences for their benefits, their work and their ability to travel. The state has let these people down. You have, Labour MPs shouted. Travel documents denied, exclusions from returning to the UK, benefits cuts, even threats of removal. The reaction to her next remark didn't seem to surprise her. The Home Office is a great Department of State. It works tirelessly to keep us safe and protect us. On top of easier access to citizenship, Amber Rudd promised those who had been hounded and had suffered devastating harm would be compensated. Labour's Shadow Home Secretary said Amber Rudd must take full responsibility for the affair. 
She is the Home Secretary. She allowed it to happen. These cases can't come as a surprise to her because for some time, many of my colleagues on this side of the House have been pursuing individual cases. She is behaving as if it's a shock to her that her officials are implementing regulations in the way she intended them to be implemented. Just down the road, Theresa May, who put much of the immigration policy in place as Home Secretary, was attending the memorial service to mark the 25th anniversary of the murder of the teenager Stephen Lawrence. Comedian Lenny Henry eyeballed the Prime Minister in the front pew as he called for wrongs to the Windrush generation to be put right. Who's got four pieces of documentation for every year that we're alive? Have you got that? Today, I want to try and get one message across, and it's this. When it comes to fighting racism, institutional or otherwise, there is no finish line. You don't get to an age when we can finally breathe out and say, yes, I reach, no need to worry about racism anymore. Just ask the Windrush generation. Our thoughts and prayers go out to those people, by the way. Anybody who's threatened with deportation or detain detainment, it's, we've got to sort that, right? The Home Secretary told Parliament her department would now show a human face in its dealings with the Windrush families. Several MPs said the government needed to check how it was treating other arrivals from long ago, from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh and East Africa. Gary Gibbon reporting. Well, now we've asked for somebody from the Home Office to come on the programme to discuss the government's immigration policy, but as has been the case for many days, no one was available. In a moment, we will speak to Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott and the Conservative MP Kwasi Kwarteng. But first, I'm joined by the High Commissioner for Barbados, Guy Hewitt, who earlier today met the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, and immigration staff to discuss the Windrush generation. And has what she has told you and what she's now told the rest of the world, as it were, has that gone far enough? I think she's definitely on the road to completing the task that is required. We went, today I had an opportunity to interact with members of the task force, go into the call centres to observe the interaction with persons who are in this predicament. And based on the obvious commitment of the staff in there, based on what the Home Secretary said today, what she said to me last Wednesday, what she said in the House and what was reiterated by the Prime Minister, I do believe the government understands that they got it wrong and it takes a lot of fortitude for anyone to be able to admit, I was wrong, I am sorry, the government has done that and they seem to be putting the things in place that we need to get the Windrush generation sorted. But the extraordinary thing, High Commissioner, is that this has actually been going on for years. Uh, and it's taken... Well, nobody really knows how it's managed to explode right at the moment when there were a whole lot of Commonwealth Prime Ministers here. I'd like to think that there was the hand of providence that I, I've been writing about the perfect storm that was created in the last week, where my fellow High Commissioners, members of civil society, um, Rani Me, JCWI, Praxis, members of the church, and I must commend senior bishops for getting involved, um, ordinary citizens who signed petitions, called in radio programs, got in touch with their MPs. It all came together, came to a crescendo just before the Commonwealth Summit, and I think that was able to give focus mm. to this historic wrong. You heard Lenny Henry there uh, speaking direct to Mrs May, and talking about institutional racism. Do you think that your government back home would see that what has happened today is consistent with, I mean, what has happened in the lead up to today is consistent with institutional racism? I was in the UK in the 90s. I have had the privilege of getting to know and admiring the work done by Lord Oosley. He has the expertise on matters like this, the UK, has the capacity to make that determination. What I am from the outside looking on seeing is things went wrong, but they've been recognised and they've been put in place. Well, on that note, um, if you'd stay with us for a moment, I'm now going to talk to our 
politicians, and um, can I start with you, Diane Abbott? Um, you said the other day that Ms. Mrs. Mrs. Rudd would have to consider her position. Do you feel that she's now gone far enough to redeem herself, or uh, does she have to go? We have to see, first of all, whether the Home Office as a department can deliver on what she's saying. She's claiming she can have case resolved in two weeks. In my experience, the Home Office works a lot slower than this. She says she's setting up, setting up a special unit. Where are those people to come from? Are they people from elsewhere in the Home Office? Or is she recruiting new people? So first of all, we have to look at whether she delivers what she's saying or whether she's just said stuff to get her past the next news cycle. But it's still something which profoundly concerns the community. I convened a meeting in here last week. 500 people turned up. She has to deliver and she has to meet the community's concerns. Uh, I put the same question to you that I put to the High Commissioner. Um, Lenny Henry at the Stephen Lawrence Memorial Service, 25 years after his death, said today uh, that th what had been happening was consistent with the same institutional uh, racism which also frustrated uh, the investigation into the murder of Stephen Lawrence. Do you agree? Let me put it like this. The entire immigration department, and I've worked with it for 30 years as an MP and for time before that as a, a staff member at the Liberty Organisation, the entire immigration department is not fit for purpose and the entire immigration department works in a way which is not necessarily to the advantage of people of colour. Then it would sound as if, uh, pursuant to the measures that she's already announced, you want Amber Rudd to in fact launch a wholesale reform of the Immigration Department? I think the Immigration Department is long overdue for a proper review. And I've said what um, Andrew, Amber Rudd has said, but what she hasn't said is if she's going to provide figures for the people in detention. She's given no detail about the compensation. So we need to hear more from her. She's promised compensation, but of course, I mean, it could be an enormous amount of money. I mean, some people have lost their homes, have lost their jobs. Uh, I mean, are you prepared to back whatever expenditure is required? I think that people have been treated terribly. They've lost their jobs, they've lost their homes, they've lost their access to health care, and above all, whether they were deported, whether they went home in despair, whether they, they refused to allow them to get back on the plane to come back to Britain, they've lost contact with their friends and family, children and grandchildren. This is absolutely contrary to people's human rights. Diane Abbott, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Well, now joining us is the Conservative M MP, Kwasi Kwarteng. And I'm wondering, I, I'm going to put uh, Lenny Henry's uh, sure. um, thoughts to you too, We're expressed at the Stephen Lawrence yes. uh, Memorial Service. Is what has happened, frankly, an insight into still existing institutional racism within the British system? I don't believe that at all. I think the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary made it very clear that they fully apologised for the situation uh, with regard to Win the Windrush generation and the very fine, brilliant people who came and rebuilt this country after the war. I think what the issue has been has been obviously a uh, administrative series of appalling administrative mistakes, but I don't believe that the kind of institutional relationship, uh, racism which existed uh, and uh, really polluted the Stephen Lawrence inquiry exists today uh, in the British government. In fact, well, the Prime well, Minister, well, well, forgive me, the Prime well, Minister has been very strong on uh, racial disparity. She spoke very much, uh, very forcibly about burning in injustices in British society. I think she's the first uh, Prime Minister to set up a, a race disparity audit and this is something which she feels very passionately about, racial justice. So I think that uh, to draw that sort of conclusion is, is not right. What if the victims had been white? Well, I think um, there are white... Uh, Never heard of anything like this with a New Zealander or an Australian or a Canadian? Well, well the Windrush generation is uh, very particular. There's a large uh, group of people, very, very fine uh, people, who rebuilt this country after the war. Now, what happened, I think, was an administrative mistake. I don't think it had anything to do 
uh, with race or anything of that kind. I think it was a genuine, there was a series of genuine mistakes. Okay, and well, now if it was an Home institutional Secretary, mistake. Now, let's, let's look, let's look but forward. But if it was an institutional mistake, something should happen to the institution. Well, what, what is going to happen to the well, institution well, that was capable well, of doing this, not yesterday, not the week before, but for the last two and a half, three and a half, five and a half years? I completely share your sense of outrage. But what's happening now is that the Home Secretary has said that there will be a unit that will deal with this uh, problem as quickly as possible. Uh, I think that's one thing that we could do, and I think we will get it done. The other thing uh, that we have done is we've offered this uh, compensation. Now, the nature of that compensation, I don't know what uh, right. that will be, but I think that's a very generous offer, and it's a real admission that uh, something wrong happened, and we've got to put it right. Patang, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, just a final thought then, Guy Hewitt. Um, I mean, hearing the politicians, do you, do you feel sanguine that, that they all understand exactly what's been going on? I think, John, one of the things that's important is to put this in a context that, yes, this has been a crisis for the last two or three years, intensified in the last few months. And I, I must give credit to some of the work that was done by people like Amelia Gentleman to really bring this to the fore. But the reality is these people's status was anomalous for decades. There have been a number of governments that would have presided over this anomaly. The fact that there is the regularizing and the tightening of rules that has brought it to the fore doesn't mean that I think any one person is to be held responsible for it. I went to the Home Office this morning. I interacted with staff who are professional, who sound committed, who want to get this done. Right. On yeah. that positive note, yes. High Commissioner, thank you very much indeed thank for you. coming in. Right. Such has been the sense of public concern, well, outrage really, over the treatment of the Windrush generation that the government has struggled to get a grip on it. For more than a week, the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, have tried. And this afternoon, Ms Rudd tried again, agreeing to just about everything asked for by those struggling to confirm their British status. If only the government had done it all sooner, you might say. The community around here was brilliant. Hubert Howard arrived proudly in the UK aged three as part of the Windrush generation. But the hopes and dreams of the boy in this photo have been casually crushed by a nightmare of bureaucracy after the Home Office refused him leave to remain. And it's still happening. I can't sleep at night. I just can't sleep at night. Despite having his mother's passport with his name in it, denied his own papers, Hubert lost his job and couldn't even travel to Jamaica for his mother's funeral. And, um, since she's passed away 2006, I haven't even been by a graveside. I haven't been there at all. And that is what's really tearing me up. Today, the Home Secretary acknowledged it should never have happened, but attempted to share the blame. This is a failure by successive governments to ensure these individuals have the documentation they need. And this is why we must urgently put it right. Your failure, shouted the opposition, but she did also promise. So I want to enable the Windrush generation to acquire the status that they deserve, British citizenship, quickly, at no cost, and with proactive assistance through the process. So from now on, citizenship fees will be waived for the Windrush generation. There will be no requirement for them to take language or knowledge tests. And Amber Rudd also promised that compensation will be available for those who'd suffered losses. David Lammy. But many are predicting the problem goes way beyond Windrush. They are from countries like Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, Nigeria, Ghana and Uganda. Many of these people have temporary leave to remain or indefinite leave to remain. It is unfair. This is a failure by successive governments. Hubert Howard listened to the Home Secretary's promises. I asked him whether compensation could possibly compensate him. How is this compensation going to work? They've got to sort out the way they're going to compensate and they've got to compensate properly because, um, like, I felt that from 2012, my life has been lost. An unintended impact, the Home Secretary called it, and we're only just starting to find out how many lives like Hubert's have been devastated as a result. And Romilly is here with me now. Um,
She's having a tough time on this, isn't she, really? And there's no let up this week. No, there certainly isn't. And if you spent any time with people like Hubert Howard in my report there, you realise that the hoops that they were being asked to jump th through to mm. prove their right to be here as British citizens were really preposterous. Mm. Uh, Hubert spent more than a decade trying to gather together all the evidence. He failed mm. partly because his primary school didn't keep attendance records going back that no, far. No, and that yeah. was enough to destroy mm. his life. The Home Office is going to some lengths now to, to reverse these injustices. But no, it's not over. Amber Rudd will appear before the Home Affairs Select Committee on Wednesday, where she'll face a, a grilling from a vet Cooper, of course, shadowed her department for four of these crucial years. But also, Windrush might be where this started, but it's not where it ends, because there are many other cases from people from East Africa, from South Asia, whose cases have yet to come out, and that's got to be deeply worrying for the government. It does seem extraordinary. Romilly, for now, thank you very much indeed. Having watched the Windrush crisis spin out of control for a week, Home Secretary Amber Rudd tried to show she's on top of it today. So news came that a statement will be made to Parliament this afternoon, and then along it came with an offer of more than the bare minimum to rectify the status of those given a hard time by the immigration authorities. The Home Secretary had clearly seen the sympathetic public reaction to the numerous cases of long-settled residents being excluded from the country, so she's giving full citizenship to the Windrush generation and compensation to those who've suffered a loss. It's hard to remember the last time that a British government tried so hard to sound not hostile to people who've settled here from abroad. All members of this House will have seen the recent heartbreaking stories of individuals who have been in this country, sometimes for decades, struggling to navigate an immigration system in a way they never, ever should have been. These people worked here for decades. In many cases, they helped establish the National Health Service. They paid their taxes, enriched our culture. They are British in all but legal status, and this should never have been allowed to happen. Well, the details of the offer may need fleshing out. The Home Secretary said the Home Office would proactively help people with the process of sorting their status out and would waive fees, language and citizenship tests. But can she guarantee that all cases will get to stay? Or will this morph into a general amnesty for anyone who's been here for a long time? Well, for the Shadow Home Secretary, the issue was how he got into this. The Home Secretary said the situation should never have been allowed to happen. She is the Home Secretary. She allowed it to happen. Yeah. These cases can't come as a surprise to her because for some time, many of my colleagues on this side of the house have been pursuing individual cases. She is behaving as if it's a shock to her that her officials are implementing regulations in the way she intended them to be implemented. The Home Secretary the Secretary has to understand that ultimately the buck stops with her. Diane Abbott. Well, we did ask the government to uh, join us tonight. Nobody was available. Uh, but I am joined by David Lammy, the Labour MP, who's been prominent in fighting for the Windrush generation here and whose own parents came uh, from Guyana. Also with us, two people who you might have seen on the programme last week. Sonia Williams believes she's one of actually nine cases the Home Secretary today said had been resolved. And Samantha barnes Garner. Her father, Clayton Barnes, spent 50 years in Britain, uh, but has been stuck for several years in Jamaica and unable to return to the UK after losing his leave to remain here and being denied uh, even a visiting visa. Uh, now, Samantha, the BBC actually managed to catch up uh, with your father oh, wow. yesterday. Uh, he's in hospital there. Yes. Um, and so we'll just play a little clip of the interview from his hospital bed. Now you're here in Jamaica, you're away from them, the, the exact time when you'd need to be with them. Yes. That must be awful. Terrible. I seen it like when they came last year to see me. It's just for few weeks. I like to go back and see them back and forwards in the holiday, and see them and come back and, you know, as long as I can do it, I'd love to. Because you, yeah. you have the rights. You've, yeah. you worked to do yeah. this. You paid into the system yeah. to do this. Yes, yes. But when did you last see him? So excuse me. Um, over a year ago, but I haven't seen him obviously while he's been really poorly, and so that's the first time I've actually been able to see his face, just other than talking to him on the phone and relying on him saying doctors won't speak to me. <laughs> 
Um, have you told him yet there's been this change today? Not been able to get in touch with him to tell him that there's been a change today. What's your reaction to it? Because it, it seems very likely. I mean, he'll come back if he wants to. Yeah, yeah. I, I have three feelings, three emotions. I'm really happy that, obviously, he's getting better. I'm extremely sad that he may not be able to fly, because I don't know... You don't know if he's well enough now. I don't know if now. he's well enough now. Um, and I'm a little bit angry that it's not happened quicker, mm. to be honest with you. Would he come back... Because he, he went to retire, in fact, didn't yeah, he? And, yeah, and he Would he come back for good, do you think, if he, if, if he had the chance now? He was living here for decades. I think he would now, yeah. because he's getting older, and our, his grandchildren, he's got four grand... Well, he's got five grandchildren, yeah. but four of them are mine, um, and he's very, very close to mine, so he hasn't seen them. He enjoys playing... watching them play football or ice hockey or whatever it is that they're doing. So I think now he probably would mm. want to stay mm. here with us. Mm. Sonia, Samantha had three words to describe her... Mm different reactions. Now, your case is a little different. Yeah. You arrived in 75, which is actually after the 73 cut-off date. Yes. But tell us what happened last week, because they were pretty quick to pick you up last week, weren't they? And yes, to, to give you a... and they gave me a no-time limit, um, um, indefinite, indefinite leave, leave yeah. to remain. And they and gave you a plastic card. card. card, yeah, which I haven't received yet. And the lady I was with, they gave her full citizenship. That's a friend now, of yours. Yes. Now, I was quite happy last week because I didn't have it before, you see. But then she announced today that it's for all yeah. of the Windrush children and the generation and everything. So I was still a bit worried because it was 73 and I'm, I came here in 75. 75. But I'm sure she means what she well, said Well, I can today. tell you, we spoke to the Home Office who said all will all, be, yes. be offered a citizenship and have fees ways. It doesn't yes. matter when they came. When they, right. So you're... I mean, it's hard to believe both of you are not sorted out. Yeah. Um, what about the issue of compensation? Because it's been mentioned... I, I mean, Sonia, you had your driving licence taken yeah. away. You yeah. effectively started on a path of most... Yeah, in appalling. 2014, um, I was made redundant, so... Looking and that back, was that I'm was because thinking, you think the, the, I, I do honestly think that I mean it wasn't actually said to me outright but I do think that was part of it because I'd only renewed all my information to my work mm. earlier on in the year of 2014 and by the end of the year it was within two weeks they just said you're being made redundant right so you I was none the wiser I just left mm. it what about for, for you Samantha yes. is it, what about compensation is that a, a, an issue for you is it um I think my dad deserves compensation. Yeah. I absolutely do. Uh, the fact that he's been away, he's not been able to come and see us, and just mm -hmm. even things like flights or... Do, do you know what I mean? Just, just anything, really. Yeah. Didn't he say... pay visa fees as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, we and, and then visa refused visa. the visa. Yeah, but, so yeah. we paid visa fees, we paid flight... We paid flight, flight, Which we sorry, then couldn't flight. take. Yeah, because... absolutely. Yeah. David Lammy, um, is this exactly what you asked for? You said you want a full... I think you asked for something which you described as a full amnesty, and they say, but it isn't an amnesty because they were legally here in the first place. Is this it? Is that now, now done, as far as you're concerned? Well, Theresa May says that people can claim citizenship who want to. I think it is important to be absolutely clear. People from the Caribbean and the West Indies um, were very much part of the British Empire. We were colonised. We were subjects. Yeah. So you deserve a passport. Yeah. And there are some countries like Antigua, St Lucia, Grenada, St Kitts that got their independence in the late 70s, early, eight, uh, early 80s. What happens to those countries after 1973? So I think the community feels very strongly it's not about indefinite leave to remain. It it's about, about a passport, passport and a citizenship that yeah. I think Caribbean people deserve. Right absolutely deserve for all they have given to this country, not just in Windrush, but over many hundreds of years. Is it, is it going to be very easy to administer this, David? I mean, telling the difference between someone who is legally here, like our friends here, and someone who is not legally here, or who came much later? Or do you believe, ultimately, anyone who's got here within the last, you know, up to, say, the year 2000, is just going to now be given the right to citizenship. Is this a general amnesty for everybody who came, or is this for very specific categories? Mm -hmm. And if it's for very specific categories, they need documents to prove that they're in those specific categories. Is that well, they need the some documents, but the burden needs to be low. Right. And, uh, accepting that, be absolutely clear, we are all here in this studio 
because the yes. British state I know. took well, us from Africa. No, there's no argument. The there's no argument about so that. That argument. So the burden over. has to be low. Right. The, the, the second set of questions are, and Amber Rudd says, "Oh, it's all terrible. These we've heard these stories. Uh, I, I'm upset with my department." There are many, many Nigerians. Well, Ghanaians, right. Nigerians, suffering the same fate as right. we speak. So, so Huge this, this is where I was going to go. So, uh, are they going to be? Do, do you think they should be included? Is your understanding that they are included? I think Britain can't have it both ways. Britain can't be in the business of trade agreements with the Commonwealth. Um, and not accept its responsibilities in relation to that Commonwealth. We can't have one set of rules for Australians, Canadians, New Zealanders, and a different set of rules for a different right. set of people. So, so yeah. now, some people are going to say, this is a really... If, if, if you go along with what you're saying, and indeed, potentially, your interpretation of what Amber Rudd has said, this is a huge change to British immigration policy that's been announced today. Is that your interpretation of what has happened that this is a kind of watershed moment in British immigration history I think that this may be the moment where the race to the bottom where the constant constant anti-immigration rhetoric where people suddenly looked at these faces saw these people and knew these people because in the end yeah. we, we've been here for so long and it might be the moment that we draw back. And but that you, is very much up to the yeah. uh, home, home sector. Would you support this being then? A, I mean, for anyone who came to say before 2000, Nigeria, Kenya, any Commonwealth country, that this is your chance to get regularised, documented, and become part of the community. Absolutely. It, it's a terrible right. thing to be living in the underground. A terrible thing to be unable to access so many state yeah. services for all of those reasons. Let's regularise these people and allow them to get on with their lives. Can I just ask you each, the tone of the speech today seemed very different to the tone in which immigration has often been talked about. Did you, did, did you feel that? Did you appreciate in any sense? Does it feel like a big moment to you in which the debate has changed? It does feel like a big moment. But at the same time, my dad's still not here. Right. So it's got to happen. It's got to happen. To, in yeah. my opinion, it's like, that's great, but when yeah. is it happening? Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't have, in my opinion, I don't have a lot of time now. My dad's 82. Mm. So, you know, if this is going to happen over the let's next not, couple of years... Let's it's not just... be talking about it for Absolutely. another year. Absolutely. Yeah. Sonia? I feel the same way, sort of things like, when, how long is it going to take for them to give me full citizenship and a British passport instead of well. giving me um, indefinite leave to remain? Good luck with it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.